Hello and welcome to class number 19 of the UPSC prelims 2024 quick revision series. Today marks the beginning of a new subject. From today, we'll be beginning to discuss geography related news that has been important in the last one year or so. So far, we have already completed subjects such as Indian polity, economics, environment, and now we are starting today with geography. Thank you so much for being regular here. If you have missed any of the earlier classes, you can still access them. Go to the description of this video. I've given a link of the entire playlist and you can see on the title which subject and which particular class you have missed and you can watch that. Also, in case you need the PDF of these lectures, what you need to do is go over again to the description of the video, find out a link for the Telegram channel, join the channel and you will get all the PDF of these lectures and much, much more. Without any further ado, let's begin. We have already discussed about 190 topics so far. We are starting with 191. First topic in the news, Arctic amplification. What is Arctic amplification? As the name suggests, this is an increasing trend of temperatures are increasing in the Arctic Circle and in the nearby region. The pace at which the temperatures in the Arctic are increasing is much, much more as compared to the pace at which the global temperatures are increasing because the base in the Arctic region is so low that any increase in the temperature will be considered much, much higher and much more disastrous. This is called as Arctic amplification. How do you define it? Technically, you define it as increasing warming taking place in the area north of 67 degree north latitude. So do remember north of 67 degree north latitude. When temperatures increase there, this is called as Arctic amplification. The difference between the poles and the tropics, the difference in temperature is called as Arctic amplification. Now, why is this happening? There are a lot of reasons, global warming obviously being one of them. But if you look at exact reasons of what is happening here, the melting ice cover in the Arctic means there is much more land and water that is getting exposed to sunlight. That means many more solar radiations are being absorbed, thus increasing and accentuating the entire impact of temperature. Heat is transferred from the tropics to the poles through the air circulation system and that is also leading to increased Arctic amplification. This is pronounced in the Arctic much more than as compared to Antarctica. Do remember that. And why is this? Because Antarctic is an ocean covered with sea ice while Antarctica is a higher elevated continent covered with enduring ice and snow. So do remember this difference. It can be asked by the UPSC. Why do we see much more concerns about Arctic and its warming as compared to Antarctic and its warming? This is the reason behind that. You can pause for a couple of seconds, read it completely to understand this in your mind. What are the causes? The first main cause is the ice albedo feedback. Means the reflection of the sun rays that fall on ice that is also leading to much more sunlight being absorbed in this region now. Sea ice and snow have much high albedo meaning that they have much higher chance of sunlight being reflected back. That means they are capable of reflecting the most solar radiations as compared to water and land. So as more and more ice goes away as more and more water comes in contact with solar radiation, it will absorb much more sunlight. So basically the process itself with, will increase the heat that is generated in Arctic. If there's this much ice, it will absorb much lesser ice wave or it will absorb much lesser sun radiation. As the ice starts to melt, when you have water here, it will absorb much more sun radiations and it will increase your overall temperature. That is what is happening in Arctic right now. Over here, you also should remember what is lapse rate. This is the rate at which the temperature drops with elevation decreases with the warming. All these are important parameters that you need to remember for the prelims examination. Related to this is the next news that is permafrost. As the name says, permafrost means permanent frozen area means an area that has been permanently frozen for many, many years that is called as permafrost. Now, something interesting is happening here. For a very long time, the scientists thought permafrost is good for us because 
it is actually storing a lot of carbon. If that carbon is released in the atmosphere, it will further increase our global temperature. Now what is happening because of an increased temperature, a lot of these permafrost are melting. Ice that was frozen for many decades, now it is being dissolved slowly. With the dissolution, a lot of harmful gases that were stored inside the permafrost are getting released. Some of these gases, in fact, even have radioactive activities. These gases being released now can be harmful for the environment. So permafrost from being a carbon sink is now turning into carbon source because it is now releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Why? Because it is now melting. How to define permafrost? Basically, this block of ice that has been permanently frozen for a minimum of two years and it can go up to thousands of years. It can be a few feet and it can be more than a mile also as we see in Arctic, for example. Although the ground is permanently frozen, on top of that, it is not always covered in snow. It may not have snow on top, but underneath it, it might have one mile of just frozen ice and nothing else. It can be found on land and below the ocean floor as well. They are most common in regions with high mountains in the Earth's higher latitudes, as you might expect, in North and the South Poles. Again, these are seen in areas which you expect where there is extremely, extremely harsh temperature, Siberia, Alaska, Canadian Arctic, Greenland, etc. and in Tibetan Plateau as well. What is the composition of these permafrost? They are a combination of rock, soil, sand, all that is hold, held together with the help of ice. And that is why when the ice starts to melt, all of that gets disintegrated. They contain soil that is mostly made up of minerals that is in the lower permafrost layer. The layer of soil on top of the permafrost does not stay frozen throughout the year. The top layer might be frozen, might not be frozen. So it's not necessary that at that very top you should have ice only. Underneath it, you will have ice. That is the concept of permafrost. Another new discovery that was in the news was the discovery of the blue hole. The world's deepest blue hole was discovered in Mexico. This is very, very recent. As you can see, May 2024. So just this month itself, scientists have discovered a 900 foot deep sinkhole of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It is one of the deepest blue holes in the world. The one that is comparable to this is China's dragon hole that is found in the South China Sea. The blue hole is a large marine cave or sinkhole. Basically, if you look at, let's say this is the surface of the ocean. Underneath this, something like this is formed. That is basically the blue hole. These geological formations are characterized by deep blue color because the light is absorbed in such a manner. It is very, very rich in marine life. You will see a rich, diverse marine life available here, including corals, sea turtles and even the sharks. Some of the best known blue holes include the dragon hole, teens blue hole, etc. Do remember these pointers because a UPSC might ask a question and one of the statements can be that no marine life is found or very little marine life is found in the blue hole. That is opposite. Actually, a lot of diverse and vibrant marine life is found in these blue holes. Do remember that. Here are a few features to distinguish between blue holes and deep trenches. So deep trenches are extremely, extremely deep. For example, the deepest one known is the Mariana Trench over 36,000 feet deep. They are mainly found in convergent plate boundaries while the blue hole is found in continental shells, reefs, etc. The way that they are formed is also very different from each other. Another interesting news from Kerala is about Mysterica swamps. Swamps, as you know, are areas where there is shallow water almost throughout the year. Those are swamps. The name Mysterica actually comes from the tree that is found in this area. So there is an area in Kerala that has a lot of this mysterica trees. In normal language, you call them the nutmegs, nutmeg trees. I'm sure if you are fond of cooking or you are regular in the kitchen, you know what nutmeg is. It's a spice that is usually used in Indian kitchens. 
So there are a lot of nutmeg trees in Kerala and that area is called Mysterica swamps. Why is it in the news? Because this rare forest ecosystem is seeing a steady decline in Kolam in Kerala. Why? Because of human intervention, too many cutting of trees, too much uh, act human activity in this part along with climate change is actually hampering this entire Mysterica swamp area. As I said earlier, these are named after the tree species that are found in this area. They belong to this family commonly known as a nutmeg family. They are usually found in the Western Ghats of Southwest India and Southeast Asia as well. Some of them are also seen in Andaman and Nicobar Islands. They are characterized by waterlogged and acidic condition, which is very obvious if they remain waterlogged throughout the year, they will obviously turn acidic. The soil etc in that area will turn acidic. They are situated in low lying areas, river, valleys or nearby a water source as such. They mainly have trees from the nutmeg family. These trees are interesting because they have adapted over centuries to these water logged conditions. They have still roots means roots that emerge from the base of the stem nodes. When the water is diverted from these swamps to other plantations, this is when it becomes detrimental for them. It is also exploited for non timber forest produce collection and also for medicinal plants. These are important because they have a capacity to store carbon, much more capacity as compared to some of the other trees. Also, they retain water act as a sponge. So when required, they can also be used as a source of water. They have perennial water availability. Next interesting news, the government of India has been contemplating over building salt cavern base reserves. What exactly is this? Many countries around the world, including India, have something called strategic petroleum reserves. So in simple terms, the government wants to store some petrol for emergency situation. What if international prices increase all of a sudden? We should have some petrol stored like a bank locker kind of a stuff when we can use it for emergency purposes. How do you store huge amounts of petrol? You have to store it underground. So far, what we had been doing is we had been building rock caverns. So basically in the rocky areas, you basically drill and then you identify an area where it will be safe to store all this petrol and you store petrols in these rock caverns. Now an idea has been found out that why not identify a location where rather than drilling in the rocks, we can have salt cavern. Salt cavern means let's say in Rajasthan, you found out that this is a land underneath. There are a lot of, there's a lot of salt deposit. So what do you do? You basically put a lot of water inside. Salt is dissolved in water and that salt is taken away. That creates a hollow space. That hollow space will be used now to store petrol. This is the idea of salt cavern base reserve. So rather than drilling into rocks, you find out area where there is a lot of salt reserve. You basically dissolve the salt by putting in a lot of water, create that empty space, empty vacuum and store all, all your oil in that. Countries such as the US do it very efficiently. We are also contemplating this idea. Why? Because it is easier to do. It is safer and it is much, much, much cheaper. So there is a lot of study going on in this regard. Study is being done by Engineers India Limited, which is obviously a government owned company. This process of dissolving salt and removing it to create the empty space. This is called solution mining. This involves pumping of water in the areas with large salt deposit and then making sure that these caverns can be used to store oil in the long run. The rock based caverns on the other hand, which India has been using for a long time, they're constructed by drilling, blasting, removing the rock layers and then creating the storage space which can be then used as natural barriers because you have to create a space where the oil is not seeped, oil is not absorbed because you can't have a situation where you put in 100 liters of oil, 50 liters is absorbed by the boundaries. You have to have a material which does not absorb any oil. Salt based caverns, which we are discussing now, they are supposed to be simpler, faster, naturally well sealed because they will not absorb any oil. As I said, in the US, which has the largest oil reserves in the entire world, that is the emergency oil reserves, 
they rely exclusively on salt based cavern or salt cavern based facilities only so it's not that we are doing it for the first time there are other countries that have already done this they hold an expertise in this also because there's salt lining in the cavern salt has a very low absorbance of oil thus it will create a natural barrier against liquid and gaseous hydrocarbons so you will not expect a lot of oil being absorbed by the salt in the nearby area it is something that the government of india is looking at very closely we have chosen rajasthan because it has abundant soil formations there is a refinery as well in barmer and there are crude oil pipelines already in rajasthan so there is infrastructure present already we would not have to work much there are studies going on however it might result into a practical solution very soon these are the existing strategic petroleum reserves that india already has as you can see most of them are in south india mangalore padur visakhapatnam etc as you can see most of these are nearby the coastal areas because how do you transport so much oil here the reason that rajasthan is suitable without being a coastal area is that there are a lot of pipelines so you can basically send a lot of these petrol it has to be near the refinery so that you can easily transport oil and you don't have to work hard doing that next we will talk about a report called the high vice report published by icimod the report brings bad news the news is that the mighty hindu kush himalayas might see a decrease in the water supply by 2100 now this is again not something that you should be surprised by most of the mighty mountains around the world that you or that bring in water to major rivers because of their ice caps many of them are seeing and witnessing a reduction in the water storage and the same is happening in the hindu kush mountains this is what is being seen in this report called the high vice report this high vice report is published by international center for integrated mountain development the key findings of the report are glaciers disappeared 65% faster in 2010s than the previous decade availability of water will peak in the middle of the century and then it will start to decline so around 2050 we will have the most water available in the hindu kush mountain ranges and then it will start to decline how will it impact it will have a major impact on populations around the world especially in the mountain communities that depend upon this water source for their livelihood for property heritage infrastructure etc not just this the mountain infrastructure the mountain uh, habitat is anyways extremely extremely it's, it's extremely delicate and you can't expect a lot of changes there so we'll have to see how the government plans to actually come up to a solution to this problem this region or this uh, mountain range the mighty mountains one single range extends from the afghanistan afghani country or afghanistan rather till myanmar then it includes on the way india nepal etc and it ends somewhere in myanmar this entire mountain range is also called as asia's water tower it's also called as a third pole of the world after the north and the south pole because of its climatic similarity with the two poles these mountain ranges supply water to some of the best known rivers in the entire region the brahmaputra the ganga indus iravadi mekong yangtze yellow river all of these get their water from the himalaya ranges be it the hindu kush himalayas and the other parts in the himalaya ranges next 197 a study reveals again nothing new but a study reveals that the earth's spin axis has tilted even further because of excessive ground water extraction let's imagine human kind has extracted so much water from the ground that we have tilted the earth's axis now this is not a new discovery but the fact is that it is still happening and it has been confirmed this has been confirmed by a study in geophysical research letters now how does it happen how is it possible see the simple idea is when you take out ground water means you are changing the mass distribution of the earth in the surface of the earth when you take out a lot of water from one place and you don't take out water from the other place obviously it will lead to change in the orientation of the earth and this is why it is actually resulting in a drift in earth's rotational pole and that is why we see 
that there is an impact here. Earth's axis was also impacted by ice sheets and glaciers. It's melting because again, it led to change in Earth's mass distribution. Now, groundwater extraction has also added to that list. As you know, North and the South Pole are the axes where it intersects the surface. However, these are not fixed. These axes and poles fluctuate due to variations in Earth's mass distribution. In the past, the poles drift was only caused by natural forces such as the oceanic currents on which humans did not really have any chance of making an impact. But now it is being done with human impact as well. The role of water, extraction of water rather, on how the Earth's surface or how the Earth's axis is, was first discovered in 2016. And since now, distribution of groundwater has been confirmed by a lot of scientists around the entire world. In terms of numbers, from 1993 to 2010, Earth has tilted about 80 centimeter east. Do remember this part. From 1993 to 2010, people have pumped out 2150 gigatons of groundwater or about 6 millimeters of sea level increase. This excessive groundwater extraction has caused the Earth's pole to drift at about 4.63 centimeter per year between these resulting in about 80 centimeter of tilt towards the east. To remember, it is towards the east. The most redistribution has happened in West North America and Northwestern India. Both are located at mid latitudes. That is again an indication that you can't just say that it's the developing countries or least developed countries that are undertaking groundwater extraction activities. Even North America has been targeted as the area where most of the groundwater extraction is taking place. This impact again has been seen for many years now. It might seem like a very small tilt 80 centimeter east, but again, there is no such conclusion as to how will it impact the earth in the long run. It's not good because when human interventions change something that is naturally occurring that can bring a disastrous effect in the long run but at least right now where we stand we do not know the long-term implication of what are what is going to happen in this area the next news is about india's cotton production as per a recent report india's cotton production has dipped to a 15 year low and the government of india is looking to revamp cotton farming in india on which a lot of farmers are dependent here are a few things about cotton production in india that you must remember India, as you know, has introduced BT cotton, that is radically modified cotton, that has given a boost to India's cotton production a few years back. Right now, India is the world's second largest producer of cotton after China. In India, it is Maharashtra, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and Punjab that see most of the cotton cultivation. It requires a substantial amount of rainfall, be it in terms of water irrigation or natural rainfall. About 600 mm of annual rainfall is suitable for this. It requires well-drained soil with nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Please do remember India's introduction of BT cotton rather in India was a major boost to the cotton production in India overall. We cultivate different varieties of cotton including the short staple and the long staple cotton as well apart from BT cotton and Desi cotton. Next news is from Singbam Creighton. There are studies ongoing which indicate that Singbam Creighton's unique geological features can give information about Earth's surface and how Earth's atmosphere has progressed over many centuries. Now, Singbam Crater is extremely famous for its history. Due to its old age, a lot of research has been conducted in and around the Singbam Creighton. It has now revealed that about three and a half billion years ago in this region, the volcanic eruptions were very, very, very common. What are these craters? They are stable portions of continental lithosphere, which consist of the two topmost layers of the earth, that is the crust and the uppermost mantle. They are found in the interiors of the tectonic plates and they give a lot of information about how the earth's atmosphere has changed, about how tectonic activities have taken place because you can see the rocks in this area and then you can see its formation as well. The Singbam Craton is in Jharkhand. 
Odisha and West Bengal. So it's a very, very large area. This gives us information about the presence of many volcanoes in this part of the world billions and billions of years ago. It is from the Archean age. It's a part of India's larger shield, which is a stable continental crust. It is known for occurrences of banded iron formations called BIFs. That is why it's a part of the mineral belt. As you know, Jharkhand, Odisha, this is the mineral belt of India. This craton has also undergone many changes over the billions of years of its formation. There has been a lot of stages of metamorphism that has changed how this craton is right now, but it does give us a lot of information about the past. From this news, what do you have to remember? Just remember its location. The fact that it is present or it is located in Jharkhand, Odisha and West Bengal. And do remember that it gives an indication about frequent volcanic eruptions in this part of the world about three and a half billion years ago. It talks about, for example, submarine mafic volcanism that talks about the volcanic eruptions 3.5 to 3.3 billion years ago. It also helps us in comparative analysis of Earth's tectonic activities in this era as compared to the earlier era. The last news from this part of class number 19 is that Brahmani Natural Arc has been given National Geo Heritage Site status. We discussed in the previous class also that two sites have been given this National Geo Heritage Site status. This is the third one. This is the Brahmani Natural Arc. This is the largest natural occurring arc in the entire world. There are a lot of theories and stories about how it may have come into being. It's said to be from the age of the dinosaurs and it still exists. The Geological Survey of India, as we discussed, is the agency that gives this geological heritage tag to these sites. It is present in the Kanika range of Sundargarh Forest Division of Odisha. It dates back to the Jurassic period and this is the largest natural arc in India with a geo heritage tag. It has a base length of about 30 meters, height of about 12 meters. Apart from this, India also has two other natural arches that are very famous among the tourists. One is in the Tirumara Hills in Tirupati and the other one is in Andaman and Nicobar. But both are much smaller than the one that we see in Sundargarh that has been given the geological heritage tag by the Geological Survey of India. This is composed of ferruginous sandstone. It dates back to the lower to middle Jurassic age. Jurassic age means the age of the dinosaurs and the geological significance of the site began simply in 2017. So it's not very old. It was discovered very recently. It was discovered in the coal exploration in this district. And since then, there has been a lot of study going on in and around this arch. This brings me to the end of class number 19. I hope it is helping you in your revision. If you want to get the PDF of these lectures, join the Telegram channel. The link is in the description of the video. If you missed out on any of the earlier classes, I'm giving the link of the entire playlist here as well. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one. Jai Hind.